Cultured Community. Um, we're just going to move on now to one of the main characters, okay, if Ionesco in the, in the play of The Shepherd's Chameleon. So I'd like to introduce you to Thomas Solberg, who is playing um, Ionesco, okay. I'm just going to give you a little insight into the main character because obviously this is, um, I guess, really who drives the whole the, the play. In uh, manner of speaking, yeah, anyway. he's the one who's visited by these uh, three Buffalo Museum. Okay, all right. So, first of all, to start off with, can you give us a little insight into um, you know how you went to play the part? I mean, have you played in a scope before? No, no, no. I've never auditioned for the part then because of an uh, email from Roger Sales saying we're producing. Fantastic. So this is kind of a, a first, um, the first time you've played a, a character Absolutely. like that. So preparing for it, was it like, oh my gosh, I've got to, I've got to play a madman? <laughs> or was it more of like, oh, this is, this in, is good, this is In a way, um, <laughs> it's kind of thing, actually, when I, uh, when I auditioned for the piece the first time, I went through a very difficult time, so I could sort of relate to a lot of stuff that was going on with Vionesco. There was, uh, his man was sort of, his mind is breaking down, yes. either on account of him not being able to do something or, or something just gone horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. So there, there is that thing that it's, it's, it's about an escape mm -hmm. and how far does he escape, how far down that rabbit hole does he eventually go. Mm -hmm. So I, I found it very interesting and for me, researching the part, reading the part, getting into that became an escape for me. Yes. So that has been very helpful. Yeah, I think um I mean, we're going on about um, Ernesto being, having his three, these characters being a subconscious, almost mirror projection of what's going on in his mind. I mean, in society today as well, you know, there's a lot of things going on um, that we can't quite, we can't quite understand. And sometimes, you know, when we're, when we're faced with things in the media, it doesn't quite relate to normal life. I mean, in terms of everyday life, you know, you can think of things like Hollywood or soap operas or, you know things like that. So, is it almost an education to watch to watch the, how this man deals with with all these um, inadequacies, all these tauntings, and, and things like that? There are educational elements to it, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, how, even though it's a comedy. Yeah, exactly. Well, how 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 direct the education is? That's that's up to the sort of individual. It's yeah. more something that, that becomes open for interpretation. So, how do you see it? What do you take out of this mm -hmm. yourself? Ultimately, this is a play about uh, one man having uh, conversations with three you know, physical manifestations of his yeah. you know, psyche. Yes. So, um, obviously, he has some very deep-seated insecurities, which keeps getting brought up, and he, this, this is what the, the Barts uh, try to exploit, sort of gain supremacy yes. and control. Yes. Because, um, you know, there was a lovely, you gave us a quick snippet earlier on and saying things about, oh, we, we will, I want a half-filled auditorium, you know, he was worried about getting, uh, Ian Leslie was worried about getting the first draft fit ready, um, you know, talking about not having dull sentences, he wants everything, you know, uh, fast-paced. So, in, I guess, uh, you know, in, in ordinary life, we do, we do have shortcomings and we do have things that we're a bit, sort of, we go a bit OTT over in terms of, you know, we're not quite perfect, are we perfect, things like that. So, how, how do you find that portrayed on, on the in theatre? Um, so, I mean, because it's quite surreal, because obviously, it's, how, do you, how do you imagine what's going on in someone's head for a person? So what kind of... Well, the way, I, the way I sort of approached them was um, these things they say um, and these things that the um, bots mm -hmm. say to him. So where do they come from? Because they obviously has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So um, we started then working on the assumption that things like, oh, we have, we have a speech company wants your play. Obviously, that could have been said by his agents. Yeah. Um, you know, and and you know, his play ready and stuff like that, and management and all that kind of people, like they could come in and just laugh and criticize them, uh, critics and all that kind of uh, stuff. But then um, uh, we looked at it and we also thought, well, he is apologizing for something. Because he's also, well, if only we could fill it, or if, if only um, you know, the play was absolutely ready. And in a way, maybe the play already is ready, but he's not committed himself to uh, put it out yet. But 
the season is getting on, he needs to get something done, and in a way he sort of sees this as um, a last opportunity to do something, mm -hmm. and he's so afraid that it's not going to become love, and people aren't going to enjoy it as much as he as much as he thinks. Yeah, he's not going to get the recognition he's got. Uh, he, he what feels he deserves for it. So yeah. it's, 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 in a way, it's a case of do I put myself out there, yeah. or do I, and then you know, put myself open for criticism and rejection. In according to the theory of alienation, I shall not tell you the third time. But, but how do I do it? Without any self-identification. You've always made the mistake of being yourself. Who else could I possibly be? Alienate yourself. Or do I just keep it with me where it's a, uh, it's a lot safer? Yeah. yeah. Where I don't have to expose myself to that. Yeah, I think that's um, well, that's a great way of looking at it. Obviously, the, even the stage is quite creative. There's lots of books every, um, everywhere, and it's quite a minimal stage, but yet, you know, um, surreal at the same time. So it's not like a traditional theatre setup where there's backdrops. Is there going to be? Um, essentially, uh, the stage, as uh, far as the stage design we've seen, is that uh, UNESCO is going to be sitting in UNESCO's chair. It's going to be slanted and tilted to the back, and it's going to be facing the wall. It's going down on that. It's a kind of a representation of of all his duties, all his chores, everything he has to do. So, sort of, you know, bending in on it. It's going to be in, he's he's in this sort of claustrophobic space. It's filled with you know books and manuscripts and paper, yeah. ripped up pieces uh, of his work and other people's work. So. There is that, uh, that's one of the things I found really interesting about him, uh, Eugene Inesco, how um, it, the absurdism of his comedy comes from, um, you know, what, what he liked to say was that he was trying to destroy language. Yes. And he was comparing himself with Beckett, who was also another absurdist, and how he would destroy language by saying nothing. In this play, he um, destroys language by saying everything and making up language, making up words. And, it to the point where things become a bit nonsensical. Okay. <clears throat> Fantastic. Thank you so much for giving us, um, you know, such an intuitive introduction to the play. And I'm sure that, you know, um, people. Well, if you come down and see, I'm sure you can actually, you know, understand some of the things that um, that Thomas is talking about in terms of the portrayal by this on stage. So thanks.